Hallelujah. Come on, put the blessed name of Jesus in the atmosphere. Somebody take delight in the fact that we can call upon a true and a living God. That we can call upon an all-powerful God. An all-knowing God. A God that said there's nothing that you could be walking through. Nothing that you could be going through that's too big for me. Come on, somebody ought to bless his name in here today. Hallelujah, God. It is a privilege and it is an honor to come before you, God. To come before you with our hands lifted up. To come before you saying, Holy Spirit, conduct a search and seizure over my life. God, if you find anything, as the old saints used to say, that shouldn't be, take it out, oh God, and strengthen me. It's my desire to be right. It's my desire to be free. It's our desire to be whole. Come on, can somebody bless God right there? Hallelujah, Hallelujah God. We lift up the name of Jesus. We say, Father, we humble ourselves in your presence. But we realize that without you, we can do nothing. We thank you, God, that we know that we know that the alarm clock didn't wake me up this morning. The alarm clock didn't cause me to put my feet on the floor. The alarm clock didn't cause me to get dressed this morning. But somebody said, grace and mercy. Father, we thank you today. We thank you that somebody didn't wake up this morning, God. But we thank you for the privilege of knowing, God, that we're praying. We're pressing and we're covering people we know as well as those that we don't know. God, we've come with a shout in our spirit because we know that eyes haven't seen, God. Ears haven't heard, Father. We have not yet received or come to an understanding of just what you're going to do, Lord God. And it's not because of us, but it's because of you. It's because of the fact that it's not about us and it's all about you. So, God, we realize that we can't do anything without you. So we say, Spirit of the living God, full fresh in this place. Have your way, God. Shake some stuff up, Father. Turn some stuff around in the name of Jesus, Father. We know that you're able. We know that you're powerful. We know that there is nothing that you cannot do. Have your way in through those who are going to bring the word today, Father. We've come with a spirit of expectancy. Oh, God, we've come with a spirit of hope. We come, dear Lord, saying, Father, it's me, oh, Lord. It's not my brother. It's not my sister. But it's me, oh Lord, standing in a need of prayer. But Father, I don't come as one who does not know that it is no secret what you can do. What you've done for somebody else, you can do for us. I've come this morning not as one who doesn't have a testimony. Because when I look back over my life and I think about how far you brought me, God, that's enough for us to shout. That's enough for us to give praise. That's enough to give glory and honor to you. So we say, Father, we invite you in this place. God, move like you want to move. Do what you want to do in and through us, Lord. That when we leave this place, we're going to leave the better. We'll leave transformed. We'll leave redeemed. We'll leave, Father, with our spirits leaving up to heaven, saying, what a mighty God we serve. If you agree with that prayer today, can you give God the best praise shall you got? Come on, bless them in this house. Hallelujah, God. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.
Come on, can you make this place sound like victory in here? Oh, come on, come on. That don't sound like you walking in victory. Come on, shout real loud. Hallelujah. 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 Listen, this is the time that we want to welcome all of our first-time visitors. So if you're visiting with Rose Hill for the first time, come on, wave at us, wave at us. Let us see you. Let us see you. Listen, we thank you so much for visiting with us. We know there are a number of different things you could have been doing, but you chose to come and fellowship with us. And for that, Pastor Donaldson, Lady Donaldson, and the entire Rose Hill family, we just want to say welcome. Come on, shout welcome. Hallelujah. Come on, and while you're at it, come on, step out of your comfort zone. Go and meet somebody you've never met before. Give them a pound. Come on, tell them it's good to see you in the house today. That's it. That's it. Come on, move around a little bit. It's okay. standing. Call me crazy if you want to, but I believe that God is going to do something special in this place today. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I need some breakthroughs. I need some breakouts in my life. I need some stuff done that only God can do. Hallelujah. I believe that he's going to put his super on top of our natural. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands in this place this morning. And come on and begin to worship with our music ministry. And let's set the atmosphere for the word to go forth in this place today. Can you do that? Come on, somebody shout, thank you, Jesus. So I will make 
Anybody going to make room for him? Hallelujah, Jesus. I will make room for you, Lord. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Oh, come on. That's your cute praise. Look at your neighbor and say, that's your cute praise. Somebody say hallelujah like you mean it. Come on, somebody say hallelujah like God brought you out of something. Somebody say hallelujah like he woke you up this morning. Like the old folks say, with a sound mind. <laughs> hallelujah. I love the last phrase of that song. It says, I'll trust the lover of my soul. Sometimes when it seems like nobody else loves you, you got to remind yourself that God does. Yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> Look at your neighbor. I want you to take just a moment of selfishness and say, if nobody else loves me, God does. God does. Now, look at your other neighbor and say, God loves me. By the way, I just want you to know God loves me. Look at the person behind you and say, I just want to remind you that God loves me. Come on, give God praise for our music ministry as they take their seats. I want you to grab your Bibles while you're standing. Grab your Bibles while you're standing. I won't keep you standing for much longer. I'm proud of you. You stood the whole time through praise and worship. Still standing. Amen. This week, this week, we got some important birthdays. Anybody celebrating birthdays in July? Anniversaries, birthdays, come on, clap. Amen. Listen, Megan's birthday, our daughter Megan's birthday is tomorrow. Shawman's birthday, Lady Shawman's birthday is Wednesday. Then my niece Robin's birthday is Friday. Amen, amen. Pray for my pockets. Amen. Pray for my pockets. Pray for my pockets that God will resurrect them. Amen. I'm teasing. Grab your Bibles and go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Here's what I, I want you to know, to know how much God loves you. I'm, I'm not supposed to be preaching right now. I'm supposed to be off right now. I was supposed to be off last Sunday. But somebody in here keeps pulling on me. First Peter 2, and look at verse number 4. The Bible says, And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by people, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. One more time. You also, as living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Claim your seats. Claim your seats. Somebody bring up the house lights for me if you would. I want to use for a subject today, scaling up. Scaling up. Say it with me. Scaling up. One more time together. Scaling up. Scaling up is a business terminology. It means to grow. It means to ramp up. It means to expand. Watch this. It means to transform. It means to morph into something greater. Let me say that again. It means to transform. The word trans means change. It means to change form and morph into something greater. Now tell your neighbor, I'm scaling up. Now watch this, though. According to Scale Up Nation, Scale Up is an entrepreneurial venture that has achieved 
a product market fit and now faces either a second valley of death or exponential growth. I want you to hear what I'm saying. I came to talk to you today, and I just shout at you. It says that it has achieved a certain level of growth, but now it's in a crucial place in space that it could either go in one or two directions. It could experience decline, or it can experience exponential growth. Now watch this. He says the second valley of death. In other words, it went through something to get here. But now that it's here, it's at a crucial point in time where even though it's made some strides, if not careful, it could still go back. I came to talk to somebody today who's been through some stuff. You made it through the first fire. You made it through the first flood. You made it through the pandemic. You made it through this challenge, and you came out on the other side. But right now, you may be facing a crucial time in your life where you have to make a decision. Am I going upward or am I going downward? Am I going forward or am I going backwards? Watch this. Every church that came out of the pandemic is at a crucial place right now because right now it can experience exponential growth or serious decline. Now watch this. I'm going somewhere. The thing I came to tell you is there's no such thing as neutrality. You are never in neutral. I don't care what your car says. Your car, when it's in neutral, will roll. And if it's on an incline, it's going backwards. If it's on a decline, it's going forward. And so watch this. Your life is always going either backwards or forward. You're either progressing or digressing. You're in drive or reverse in every part of your life. So watch this. I want you to start looking at your life critically and asking some critical questions. When it comes to this part of my life, am I moving forward or backwards? Am I progressing or regressing? If I ask you how your marriage is doing and you tell me it's about the same, there is no same. You're probably regressing because if you were progressing, you would praise the progress that you made. The funny thing about progress is people always praise progress, but people don't admit regress. And so instead of admitting regress, they say it's the same. It's not. Now watch this. Throw that to me, hers. I brought with me a brick this morning. Now watch this. If you look at this brick, you can tell it's been through something. It's been through some sunny days. It's been through some rainy days. It's been through some mud, and it's been through some dry days. It's chipping and it's aging, but I want to show you something about this brick. In order to become this brick, it had to go through the fire. And once it came out of the fire, it was solidified as a brick. But watch this. After the solidification of being a brick, what's next? The question is, why is the brick alone? I was watching a movie the other night that shook me. And it was a man who was a teacher in an architecture class. And he said, this great architect says that even a brick wants to be greater than it is. And I started to think that if a brick wanted to be greater and it's an inanimate object, then what about the people sitting in the room? And what about the people who've been through the fire and the flood and have made it through, but watch this, oftentimes feel like the brick? What do you mean? 
Watch this. I wanted to grab a bunch of bricks from my backyard because I got a little pile of bricks in my backyard. And then I meant to bring with me, I got some tile in my garage from my floor, and then I got some tile from my shower. Now, now why is that important, Pastor? Because all of those things are extras. So why do you keep the extras? I keep the extras in case one of the things that are being used now breaks and I can't find the exact match, then I'll replace that with the spare that's in the garage. But the problem is, what about the life of the spare? He's just sitting around waiting for somebody to break to be useful. And there are many people in the room right now sitting there looking and waiting on something to break so you could get plugged in, waiting on something to break so that you can be useful, waiting for something to give so that you can give what you have to give. And many of us feel like this old brick. Because the funny thing about it is if people don't think they need it, they'll Jack cars up with it, park stuff on it, throw it up out, use it for tracks and treads, use it. And how many of us in the room are being misused because we haven't been used? Some of you right now are being misused on your job because there's more in you than that's in that job. That job doesn't stretch you. That job doesn't challenge you. That job doesn't make you creative. But yet you settle there because you're waiting for what? Either to be plugged in and used or retire as an individual brick. Where are you going, Pastor? I'm going somewhere. Watch this. The Bible says God has the ability to take us, the living stones, like a brick in the hands of a bricklayer, and butt them together with some water, and line them up on top of each other, and make a wall, and the wall will make a house, and the house will be something significant so that this piece can be used in the appropriate way in which it was created. And I came to tell you today that some of you in here, you haven't allowed the master to put you in place. Because your fear, your doubt, things just ain't happen right for me. And now you're cool being an extra. When you're supposed to be in the mix. The reason why you don't sleep well at night is because you don't have enough responsibility to hold up. And at the end of the night, everybody wants to feel like they contributed and they were useful. So how do I get to a place in space where my life is useful? First thing, three things, three truths I want you to identifying your life, and I'm going to help you with all of them. What are my priorities? What are my priorities now, and what should my priorities really be? Is the main thing really the main thing? What are you saying, Pastor? Or what... Is what you're calling the main thing now really the main thing that you should be focused on? Or are you focused on means and not ends? I wish I had time to talk to you. Some of the goals that you write down are means goals. I want to make a million dollars. That's a means goal. It's not the end goal. Because you can't find what the end goal is until you start asking questions. Why do I want a million dollars? I want a million dollars so that, so that, watch this, one lady, one lady, she said, I want a million dollars. A man says, why do you want a million dollars? She says, well, 
we live we live in 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 Brooklyn. I want to move Mama to Jersey, and I want to move her with me. And uh, and I don't have the money to do it. I want to I want I want that to buy a house. And and so why do you want a house? I want a house because I want me and my Mama to live together, and I want us to be safe. Well, well, why do you want that? I want that because we got all of these mementos, and if we could just take all the mementos from all of our houses and merge together as one and consolidate, we could live together in peace and joy. And so so you. So what you're saying is you don't necessarily need a million dollars. The end goal is to get your mama in the house where she could be safe so you don't have to worry about her so that you can take care of her and you can go to work in peace. So what if you don't need a million dollars to make that happen? And the thing that you've been focusing on ain't the end. It's just the means to what you think. In fact, it's what you think is the means to the end that you don't even know you want. I hope you get what I'm saying today. What are you here for? What are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your days? Are you just competent or, or just satisfied with waking up every day, doing the same thing, hoping something changes, not knowing if it will, and calling that faith? Or are you going to be intentional about your life? And set some priorities based on, watch this, the leading of the Holy Spirit so that God will be pleased. Because God made you for a purpose and for a reason and for a time such as this. And you got to start asking some real questions. I'm off script right now, but, but you got to ask, why was I born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana? Why am I here? And why was I born during this period of time and not that period of time? Why was I? Because purpose always leaves clues. Now watch it. And how do I measure my progress? If you can't measure your progress, then watch this. You'll always go back. Anything that's important to you has to be measured. If you've got a money problem, measure your money. Where's my money going? What am I spending it on? This might be boring to you, but if... If you got a weight problem, find out what you're eating. Write everything down. Measure what you're eating. Look at your exercise. See if you had a caloric deficit. And if you had a caloric deficit, you got to lose weight. But if you don't measure. So what I'm saying to you, you're leaving to chance stuff that you feel like God is leading you towards. And watch this, gathering with other like-minded people so that you can be encouraged and inspired by people who may not want to do what you do exactly, but want something more out of life, want to be useful, want to be used by God, want to do kingdom business on the earth, want to be an agent of change. You got to rub shoulders with people who sharpen your iron. And watch this. You got to genuinely care about people. I'm about to go through a list of stuff. Watch this. Dr. King says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught up in this inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Here's what the world doesn't understand. What? I do affects you, what you do affects me. So if you harm me, your harming me harms you. Maybe not directly, but indirectly. The ripple effect eventually will get you. And so watch this. If you're just saying, I want this, I want to do that, it's me and my, and you're not worried about anybody else, you'll probably never accomplish what you're trying to do. If what you're asking God for doesn't help somebody else, you want to see God move, start asking God to do stuff that doesn't just help you but helps other people too. Because God loves people who love people. God, give me this. Why? 
so me and mine. But what if you say, God, do this so that we, we, God bless me so that, watch this, bless me financially, not just so that I can give, but now I'm in position to teach and raise and elevate people. God, heal me, not just, not just so I can be healed, but so that people can see that you are a healer. Come here, somebody. Come here. Y'all, y'all not talking back to me. God, deliver me. Why? So that other people can see that you're still in the delivering business. And those who are caught up on drugs or whatever can still have hopefulness that they can be delivered too. God, do it for me so that I can be a witness of your goodness in the earth and I can be a walking, talking testimony of the goodness of the Lord. This is not just about me. Get me out the ghetto so that somebody else in the ghetto can see that the ghetto can be got out of. Or go back and change it. But watch this. Your goals can't just be personal. Helping you more than you know. Now watch this. How do I get to a place in space, God, where I can be used of God so that I can be a part of this holy priesthood, so I can do kingdom business in the earth, so that I can be used, so I can feel fulfilled, I can have joy in my life? Well, after those three things, the Bible says right here, verse number two, I mean verse number one, therefore rid yourselves of all malice. He talks about the transformative power of the word in chapter one, and then he says, therefore, and watch this, if the word is transforming your life, here should be the byproducts of the trans- byproduct of the transformation. Rid yourselves of all malice. Now, here's a heavy question. Is there stuff still in me that could be hindering me? Am I really free? Or am I vacillating between? Do I have maliciousness in me? Well, what is malice, Pastor? Number one is the wrong desire. But number two, watch this, it's a desire to hurt or to harm. Number one, do I have a wrong desire? Am I trying to holler at her husband? Him, wife. Stuff, I'll talk about it later, that don't, belongs to me. (laughs) Wrong desire. Am I trying to hurt somebody? Am I manipulative? Am I at work setting traps? When God has not called me to be in a trap setting business, And God says vengeance wasn't mine. And so while I'm worried about being vengeful and worried about paying people back, couldn't my priorities and my focus be on something greater than that? And so the reason why I can't hate you, not because you didn't hurt me, Because hating you holds me. And so hurting you or trying to hurt you, looking for opportunities to hurt you, ultimately hurts me. I'll go. Let's let's go. Watch this. Deceit. Get rid of deceit. Deceit is trying to cause someone to accept as true or valid that which is false or invalid. Trying to cause somebody to accept as true, as valid, something that's false or invalid. Am I wasting my time trying to act like or convince you of something that's not even true? I'll go deeper later. Watch this. Hypocrisy. A person who puts on false appearances of virtue or religion 
a person who acts in contradiction to his or her stated beliefs or feelings. Am I hypocritical? Am I hypocritical? Sometimes I am. I said don't do that and did it. Who's <laughs> you tell your kids don't eat that junk, then you eat that junk. That's hypocritical. You say don't do this and still you do it. Hypocritical. Watch this. Envy. Envy is covetousness. A desire to have that which belongs to someone else. Instead of trying to get my own, am I trying to get yours? I got quiet in this Christian church. Slander, a false statement usually made orally, which defames another person. Am I talking about people? Spending my time gossiping. Spending my time putting people down. Sometimes even lying on people. <laughs> to tarnish their image. Because they intimidate me. Somebody say, Pastor, you should have took the day off. You should have just stayed. <laughs> so the Bible says, rid yourself of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. And watch this. Desire, and all change starts with desire. Desire, pure milk of the word. Pure milk of the word. The word pure, watch this, really means open-mindedness. And so the word will never change a mind that's not open. And so if you walk into the word already convinced, then how can the word change what you're already convinced of? But when you walk into the word and sit down with the word, you've got to cleanse your palate. You know what a palate cleanser is? When you, when, you, when you sit down and you have different dishes and servings and they bring out the, they bring out the hors d'oeuvres and they bring out the entree and they bring out the dessert and all these different seven-course meals, five-course, three-course, what they do in between is they give you a palate cleanser, something that takes the taste of the last thing off your mouth so that the last thing that you ate doesn't influence the taste of the new thing that you're about to eat. And for some of us in the room, we need a palate cleanser. We need a mind cleanser so that, watch this, the next season of place that God has taken us into won't be influenced by the flavor of the last season that was distasteful. And you're saying, I don't like this season because some of the last season is still caught up. The pure milk. Milk. Milk is a necessity. Milk represents a need. A kid needs milk to live. Pure milk of the word. And watch this. It's the word that changes our lives. But watch this. The word can change our life, but growth has to be intentional. A closed Bible never fixed the closed mind. Closed Bible has no shot at a closed mind. Watch this. So it says, so that you can grow. And a baby needs the appropriate nourishment as they grow. They go from milk to soft foods or milk and then mix a little, a little food in there. And then they get to a point where they get soft food and they get to a point where they get solid food. Here's the good news. The word is all those foods. For those who are baby, it's milk. For those who are adults, it's real food. For those in the middle, it can be whatever. Why is that important? Because you are what you eat. The reason why so many people are frantic right now is because they've been eating CNN. 
worried about everything. Ooh, you know, you know, I, they got stuff going around. I'd be like, don't tell me. I don't even want to know because if I don't even know about it, then I don't even worry about it. But the more I know about it, then the more I worry. They got cis strain. Of, I, I don't want to know about it. I don't, I don't watch the news. I, I just get bits and pieces because I don't want to feed myself that. I don't want to talk about all the murders in the city. I don't want to talk about all the bad that's going on. I'm not oblivious to it, but I got my hope and trust and faith on good things. So I want God to turn it around. And so people talking about let's do an anti-murder walk. No, let's do a peace walk. Let's do a joy walk. Let's do a let's do a, 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 a obedience walk. Let's let's do an abundance walk. Let's do. Why are we focusing on what we don't want? Mother Teresa said, they, they say, will you come to our anti-war rally? She says, no, I won't. She says, but when you have a peace rally, I'll be the first one there. Because whatever you focus on becomes more of. You get more of what you focus on. And if you ask yourself right now what you've been focusing on, you've been focusing on what they said on the news, what they said, oh, the president, oh, the Senate, oh, the, the man, I'm not worried about any of them. God bless all of them. But I have a God that's my source that takes care of all of my needs. And so as long as God is still on the throne, I'm going to be all right. You put whoever you want in the White House, the dog house, the blue house, it don't matter. God is my source. And you've got to be solidified in that. Watch this. It says, it says, the milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. In respect to salvation. A lot of times when we see the word salvation, we, we just think about being saved. No, that's not all salvation is. The word salvation, watch this, it means deliverance, it means preservation, it means safety, which means as you grow in the word, the word gives you the key to deliverance from your situation. I'm already saved. No, I need to know how to get out of these red bills. I'm going to heaven. I need to know how to live on earth. So I need salvation from this stuff that runs in my family, salvation from this high blood pressure somebody dealing with, this, this diabetes, this, I need salvation from what I'm currently dealing with. Yes, you need to be saved. Absolutely. That's first and foremost. But it's not just limited to saving you and getting you to heaven. But God's salvation saves you from what you're going through. It was the salvation of the Lord that saved the three Hebrew boys. It was the salvation of the Lord that brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. It was the salvation of the Lord that beat the Gideon, brought Gideon and beat the Midianites. It was the salvation. You got it? It says that if you've tasted of the kindness of the Lord, if you've tasted of the kindness of the Lord, if you've tasted, how many people have tasted of the kindness? The word tasted means experience the kindness of the Lord. And what I'm going to say is a critical point. You may not, you may not think much of it, but, but how you think of him has a lot to do with how your life will flow. If you think he's a kind God and blessings flow easily, you got faith for flowing blessings. If you think he's a hard God, hard God and, and blessings flow slowly, then you got faith for slow blessings. And it's not God's fault. What I just said. Watch this. How many people say, yeah, I'm going to go apply for that job. But I know they ain't going to give it to me. Well, you got faith. that they're not going to give it to you, and then you get mad when you don't get it. Isn't that what you had faith for? You just said they weren't going to give it to you. I have people call me sometimes and say, I know you're probably not going to give it to me, but I'm going to ask you for it anyway. Well, why? You, why? That dude asked me something the other day. Before he said he prefaced it, I know you're probably not going to do it, but I'm going to ask you anyway. 
I started to say, but why are you asking me? The answer is no. It's no. Watch this. And coming to him as to a living stone, or to a living stone, which has been rejected by people, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up into the spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Now watch this. He says, present yourself. If you want your life changed, say, Lord, you know what? God, I've been trying to fit and find where I fit. What I'm going to do this time is I'm going to present myself to the master bricklayer so that you could fit me where you made me to fit, not where I'm trying to fit. Oh, God. Oh, God. Come here, somebody. God, I'm going to put myself in your hands so that you could fit me because there's a custom spot made just for me that fits every dimple, every little scar, every little bruise. It fits me perfectly, and God, I'm going to trust you to put me in place and solidify me and do a work through me that I could never accomplish by myself. God, put me in my spot. Come on, somebody say, God, shh. Put me in my spot. Put me in my place. Put me in my places where I'm supposed to go, where I work, where I'm supposed to be, where I'm supposed to live, what state I'm supposed to be in, what city I'm supposed to be in, what church I'm supposed to be in. Put me in what job I'm supposed to be in, what business I'm supposed to start. God, I'm turning my life over to you, to a, to a wisdom that's greater than my own. God, put me in place. Watch this. Last week I told you something that was to help you. I told you, write down what you want to experience. Many people say, well, why do I write down? You just said I'm going to put myself in the, in the Lord's hand. Putting yourself in the Lord's hand means, watch this, I'm going to write down what I want to experience, but I'm going to ask God, what is it that I'm desiring or you're desiring through me so that I can write it down so I can experience it? Is it write a book? Is it travel? Watch this. Sometimes you think that God won't, don't want good things for you. You think all the good stuff you desire is your desire. When God, when God is desiring it through you. I want to travel. I want to have experience. I want to have encounters. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do that. I've had one of the greatest spiritual encounters I've ever had on a jet ski in the Caribbean. I stopped out in the middle of that water and looked at those, those islands and those mountains with all that green stuff on it and turned around and looked at all that blue water and just said, Lord, have mercy. How awesome is our God? Without that experience, sometimes it's hard to understand how awesome God is. If you've never seen the ocean, then how do you know how vast he is? Do you realize how much water that is in that ocean? That if God can put all that water in that ocean, he could give you a little job or fill your gas tank up. If God could fill the ocean, he can't fill your gas tank. Sometimes you need some perspective. You got to go see some things. Look at that mountain. Big old granite of rock. You're like, my God. I need some experiences. Why? Because experiences create exposures, and exposures expose where you're supposed to be. And some people have not had enough experiences to have enough exposure to be exposed to where they need to be. You've been in Baton Rouge all your life. Maybe God wants you to live somewhere else in California, but you won't even go. Won't even get on a plane. One of the things that God told me here with people and, and, and everybody who's been through here through these years, they'll tell you, God has allowed me to expose people to stuff, things, places, experiences, encounters, broaden their horizons. Go. I have people who had never flown on planes, bought them plane tickets. Come on, let's go. We're going. All of us, we're going. Go stay in hotels that they couldn't even afford to stay in. We're going there. All kinds of experiences. Why? Because, watch this, you don't know where you fit until you've been enough places. 
And watch this. When you go in enough places, you'll find out where you belong, but you'll also find out where you don't belong. Some places you walk in, you're like, this ain't my place right here. Thank you, Lord, for the experience, but this ain't my place. This ain't my place. I belong over here. Why? Because this is where the peace resides. You're talking about where the money resides, where the peace resides. If I find where the peace resides, the money will show up. And so sometimes you got to go to places, have encounters, have experiences. Man, I've met God in some of the places. I'm like, my God. Some days I woke up and saw stuff, didn't even pray, just say, ooh, God. And watch it. Sometimes you'll get exposed early on to where you will be, but are not ready for yet. And God will give you a glimpse just so you will see it, identify with it, and say, that felt good to me. I ain't ready for it yet. But I know that's where I'm going. Oh, I wish I had somebody in the building that understood what I was talking about. I remember one time when I was a young minister, just became a young minister, and somebody asked me to speak at a funeral and do some words of comfort. And it was at this large, large church, man, big old, big old church. And I walked up there, and man, and I, I spoke boldly for the Lord. And man, and, and all my little friends, we were young ministers. And I came back, all my friends, my friends say, so Danny, man, how, how did it feel to be up there? I said, felt like home. Now, how could it be home when I had never experienced it? Unless I was made. Sometimes you're made for stuff. That you haven't arrived at yet. And now watch this, not break. I've preached in front of thousands and thousands, TVs, internet, I've done all of that. But that one day let me know it's where I'm supposed to be. It's where I'm supposed to be. And somebody in this room, you're gonna walk in somewhere. You go. This, this, this is where I'm supposed to be. What, what's crazy is we, we take, we, we, go, we like to go to the West Coast a lot because we like mountains and water. And we go see it. We took our kids so much that my daughter calls California home. Our daughter, she calls it home. Megan calls it home. Well, every time we go back, she says, let's go home. I'm going home. She identifies with it. Like, that's my, that's my space and place. She knows I may not get there tomorrow. But I'm going home. My place. Watch this. Where are you supposed to be? Not your neighbor, not your friend, not your sister, not anybody else, not settling for what somebody else wants or somebody else's life or what your mama said you ought to be doing or your daddy said. Love all of them, but what did God say? Are you okay? And the environments you don't want, you don't want. There's sometimes you go in places your spirit don't connect with that. I, when I was young, man, we used to go and I tried to hang out with my friends in the clubs. I, you know, I went there and did try. It just wasn't my thing. I've had people tell me in places like that, you don't belong here. I'm serious. One time I was in there, a girl walked up to me. I thought she was about to holler at me. She <laughs> leaned in. She said, come here. I said, what's up? She said, you don't belong here. <laughs> I say, she right. I don't belong here. I, this is not my, I don't feel comfortable here. This is not my space, not my happy place. Y'all go here every week, do your thing, sweat it out. This ain't my spot. Now watch this. 
God needs kingdom representatives to show the love of God in different spaces and places throughout the world. And in such, what he's doing is putting bricks, living stones together, making a wall, making a holy priesthood of teachers and doctors and lawyers and judges and whatever it is that you do. And to be a holy priesthood doesn't mean that you, a pri- that you walk around, you got to have a collar. It means that you preach with your life. It means that you inspire people to be better. You invoke a hunger for God in the life of people. People look at your life and say, man, if that's what God does, I need to know that God. Now watch this. He says, a holy priesthood, a house, he says to offer. Offer means to volunteer, and it means to put on the altar. Y'all ready to go home? To put on the altar. 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 Spiritual. The word spiritual, we get caught sometimes, just means that I belong to God. I'm a spiritual being. I belong to God. So all my offerings are spiritual. But watch this. Spiritual sacrifices. Sacrifices. What is a sacrifice? A sacrifice is something that has to die. In order to get in my space and place and become who God is destined for me to be, something has to go on the altar and something has to die. What has to die, Pastor? Well, in order to walk in the new you, the old you. The reason why some people can't walk in the new you is because you won't kill the old you. You won't put it on the altar and say, I've identified where God has taken me to. In order to get to that place, I have to become a new person. And then so becoming a new person, then I have to let the old person die. Not physically. But my old ways of thinking my old ways of acting, my old mentality, my old paradigms, my old thought processes, all that stuff has to die. Watch this. If I make a decision that I'm going to be a married man, then the single Danny got to die. Y'all not shouting. Because you can't be married with a single mentality. You can't be married talking about I, 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 what I want, I want, I want. No, when we got married, we won't. What do we want? Us. Can't still be running behind women. That single. (laughs) Running behind men, because y'all, let me make sure I say that. Running behind men, (laughs) because. In doing so, I don't let the single me die. And if I'm going to be the abundant me, then I got to let the pole me. And if I'm going to be the joy for me, then I got to let the bitter. And if I'm going to be the forgiving me, I got to let the unforgiving me. If I'm going to be. Which means I got to get to a place where I have peace with all people. Peace with all people. Peace with all. And I know some of y'all, I'm preaching this. You like, dude, you just don't know. <laughs> you don't know what I'm going through, who I'm dealing with. You don't know this cat I'm dealing with. You don't know this girl I'm dealing with. You don't know. I know. I know one thing. That if you let them, watch this, they will poison you. You're trying to poison them, and you're poisoning yourself. And watch this. When you let the person know that they no longer are under your skin, it's amazing how they'll leave you alone. 
because all they really want is a reaction. And when you stop giving people who want a reaction a reaction, they leave you alone. Because they can't figure out why can't I get them to react. You can't get me to react because I've given it away. I let it go. I gave it to God. I've You got to ask yourself some honest questions. You walk around. We got folks in here. Walk around. I don't, I don't sit on that side of church because such, such over there. And I don't want that. I, don't, I can't go to Rose Hill because such, such go over there. You really want to come here, but can't come here because. Watch this. I'm done. Once God shows you the man that you're called to be, the old one's got to die. Once God calls you, shows you the woman you called to be, the old one, now you transform into a new one. Watch this. When the caterpillar goes to being a butterfly, he don't miss the caterpillar. You mean to tell me that I'm flying now? And I was walking, hiding from everything, scared everything was going to eat me, woke up every day with intrepidation. Now I'm flying over stuff I used to be afraid of, and now I'm going to look back and won't. Watch this. So what's your priority? What's your priority? Is knowing God your priority? after you get to know God, what's your priority? What has God called you to? Who has God called you to? I was thinking about this the other day. I was just thinking about it. I said, I'm, I, I know one thing I'm called to do. I'm called to teach. That's what I do. Teach various things to various people in various places at various times. I'm a communicator. It's what I do. Watch this. What do, what do you do? What are you, what are you good at? What is, what is your purpose? What is your purpose? I'm good at inspiring. I'm good at motivating. I'm, that's, that's what I do. All I want is my life to be an inspiration. What do you, what do you want? What is God call, calling you to? Well, for somebody in the room, it's greater than this. I said something last week. I don't even know what time it is. What time is it? I said something last week that one of the greatest pains that you can experience in life is the pain of regret. And watch this. As I leave my 40s, this year I leave my 40s. It seems like yesterday I was leaving my teens and leaving my 20s and leaving my 30s. On October 24th, I'll be a decade away from 60. I know I don't look it. But my simple point is to you, while you're waiting, time is rolling. So whatever you're going to do, you better be about your father's business. You better get busy doing what God called you to do. While you're waiting for life to change, you're missing out on living. Let me say that again to somebody. While you're waiting for life to change, you're missing out on living. You've been waiting on something to change for 10 years, and you could have been enjoying life, doing stuff, taking risks. I got to go. Stand to your feet. Let's get out of here. Was that good?
Now listen, do me a favor. Just nudge the person on the side of you and say, you know that was your word. Go ahead. Get the other one. Get the other one. Say, you know, you know that was your word. You didn't say a whole lot, but that was, that was for you. Yeah, that was for you. 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 Now watch this. Listen, listen to me. Listen to me good. I can't make you do anything. I'm not called to make you do anything. I'm called to teach you. I told you about that exercise last week. Three-fourths of y'all didn't do it. You ain't got to tell me. I already know. I already know. I already know. Maybe more than that. Maybe about 10% or 5% did it. But if you don't start getting serious about your life and writing some things down, write the vision. Write the vision. If you don't get serious and start writing some things down, watch this. If you don't get serious and start setting aside some time for growth, reading, studying, listening to stuff, if you don't get serious about it, you're not going to change. Let me talk to this side. With the exception of what you read and the people that you meet, in the next five years, if nothing changes, you'll still be the same. Growth. Intentional growth. And that's what the church needs to hear. Sometimes we say, I'm just waiting on the Lord. No. The Lord is waiting on you to grow. The eyes of the Lord go to 